So Michael, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about where you're from, where you grew up. I'd be, well, I'd that be would happy be great. To. That's, that an, e be that's great. an easy one. Well, nothing. There are no easy ones, really. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess I grew up in L.A. in the suburbs, um, and I don't know. I guess I'm. I was sort of a slacker um, <laughs> who sort of <laughs> invented the character of a novelist and then grew up and, and became that. Um, There's not much in my childhood to indicate that I would end up on a stage talking about books in, in Santa Fe. Um, <laughs> I would just, my, my family wasn't especially, isn't especially bookish, and, and I wasn't especially as, as a kid. There we, there we were, it was Pasadena. Um, the, the deep burbs. This is, this, is, this is not a minor burb, this is a major burb. Um, and you know, there's, this, there's this great story about how Susan Sontag grew up in, um, this, in suburban Arizona, and among, in, in, a, in a house without books in it. And for, just after she was old enough to walk, she kind of wandered out into the desert till she found a <laughs> library and like, read all the books in it. <laughs> I was not similarly precocious. <laughs> um, I was much more interested in, in, in music. I wanted to be a rock star. Um, I, I want, well, I, I either wanted to be I wanted to be either Leonard Cohen or or Jim Morrison or some hybrid of the two. <laughs> and you are. Thank you, thank you. I do my I do my best. Um, and I actually. Red Wolf, Mrs. Dalloway in particular, um, almost by accident in high school. Somebody sort of shoved it at me and said, here, read this and try to be a little less stupid, okay? <laughs> and I wasn't entirely sure I wanted to be less stupid. Um, but I did read it and had no idea what it was about. Not a clue. Um, but I did understand something about the depth and density and balance and music of those sentences. And I remember thinking, I guess I was 16, I remember thinking, oh, she was doing with language, something like what Jimi Hendrix does with a guitar. I'm probably not the first writer to compare Virginia Woolf to Jimi Hendrix, but but there's, there's, there's <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not it's not it's not it's not it's not a common comparison, um, and I wanted to try to do that, and I wanted how to put this one of the great wonders of that book, of, of, of all her work, but Mrs. Dalloway very prominently is the fact that she takes the outwardly usual and sees it for the extraordinary, unprecedented thing it is. This London, this day in June, what a thrill, what a plunge to be walking out into Tuesday in London to buy flowers. And I wanted to confer a similar kind of benediction on the place I was from. I wanted, to, I wanted my sort of smoggy, barren suburb to be made to feel, I think for my own sake, <laughs> more than anybody else's, at least at first, to be made to feel as full of weight and mystery and promise as Wolf's London in the 20s did. Hmm. Still trying to do that. <laughs> um, it's also always seemed to me that, um, and, and as the as the work has accumulated, that the books, in ways large and small, are very much books of the mother. Um, I'm thinking of Alice and Home at the End of the World, Mary in Flesh and Blood, and of course Mrs. Brown in The Hours. Um, and they're always sort of simultaneously marginal to the action, but central to the, to the emotion in the book. Um, and, and in the hours, of course, 
I, I think about how there's a kind of a mother in the great figure of Wolf, the sort of literary mother of us all. Um, and I always have the sense with these figures that there's a kind of unanswered question hovering around them as you're exploring them as characters. Um, I wondered if you saw that or what you thought that question might, might be. Yeah, it's funny. One of the things about living long enough and writing enough books is they do start to pile up and you begin to see that you seem to have certain central concerns that you would never in a million years have, have, <laughs> have thought of. Yeah. You know, 20 years ago, when I started to write books, if someone had said, you seem to, you seem to be especially interested in mothers, I would have said, nah. You know, I mean, I'm not uninterested, but, it, but, but I, w I wouldn't have thought of, of the mother as some kind of mm -hmm. huge central figure in, in all my books. But, but there she is. There she is. Um, I think at some level, I'm probably more mystified about it than a lot of people and would, would, would just spout some crackpot theory um, <laughs> about the reasons for my particular attachment to, to, to heroic figures who are mothers. Mm -hmm. um, but I can certainly tell you that when I was working on the hours, um, there are, as I said, these three, these three women who are arguably the main characters of the book. And one of them is Laura Brown, who is this housewife in Los Angeles in the late 40s. Um, and she was the character who was hardest to bring to life. Mm -hmm. I'd expected to be Virginia Woolf for obvious reasons, and none, none of it was exactly easy, but, but, well, Laura Brown is the figure who skates closest to stereotype. Mm -hmm. The unhappy 50s housewife is a figure we have seen once or twice or <laughs> you know, 10,000 times before, and she was in no way a cliche to me, but she kept coming out a little, a little bit that way on the page. She was a little cartoonish. She was a little bit not quite alive, and I couldn't get her, and couldn't get her, and couldn't get her, and tried and tried, and finally one day, I started thinking of her as an artist. Um, she's obsessed with keeping an impossibly perfect house, and on this day in the book, specifically obsessed with creating a cake to end all cakes. Um, and it's certainly possible to see that as sort of foolish, um, but, but I don't. And when I sort of made a little mental shift and thought of her as someone driven by the same obsessive, doomed, search to create perfection that Virginia Woolf was. One of them wrote novels and never quite felt that she'd written a good enough novel. The other baked cakes and couldn't feel like she ever quote, quite baked a good enough cake. When I saw Laura as being equally entitled mm -hmm. to the heights and depths as Woolf or as anybody, then there she was. Mm -hmm. She was alive to me and real. Um, and there's something, I think, about, about scale and the heroism of, of women that, that's compelling to me. Well, all three women, actually, interestingly, are artists, both Clarissa in her, in her way and her sort of artist of life, Virginia Woolf and Mrs. Brown. Yeah, They're all yeah, actually yeah. artists. Interesting. Yeah. There's actually another just little, little mother thing to say. Um, These women are not my mother, but they sort of are, too. I mean, of course they are. They are and they aren't. Um, and uh, Laura Brown is probably more like my mother than, than any character I've, I've written, though there, though there are real differences. Uh, my mother is not the kind of reader that Laura, Laura is, and she did not try to kill herself. Um, but it is in some very deep, elemental way, my mother. And um, I'm now sort of telling the story, and I, I'm not sure if it was a good idea, but anyway, here it is. Um, my mother died about a month ago um, from cancer. She'd, had it for, she'd been diagnosed about a year ago, and I was with her the last few weeks. Um, they're making a movie 
of the hours, and um, Julianne Moore is playing Laura Brown. Uh, it's, not, it's not quite finished yet, but I called the producer and said, Saint Scott Rudin, and said, um, my mother's probably not going to get to see the movie. Could, would it be possible for her to see some scenes? And they messengered over mm -hmm. half an hour of, of scenes um, to her house, hers and my father's. And you know, you mostly hear stories of Hollywood and the movies and how they just boulderize your novel and flatten it and, and snatch the life out of it, all of which are true. <laughs> um, but there I was on the sofa we'd had since I was a kid with my mother, who would live about another week, watching her already reincarnated by Julianne which she knew and I knew, and yeah, it turns out the movies are many things. They're also transcendent, transforming agents. What did she say? You know, we couldn't really talk about it directly. She said that was, that, that was wonderful. And, and we both knew what she meant. Um, another theme that runs through the books that I think, that I also don't know how how much you would have ever thought that this would be what you would do. There's, there's always the presence of someone with AIDS. If you actually look yeah. across um, the three books, there's a character in each book who either does or does not die of AIDS, but who has, who has the illness. Um, and I wondered if that was a, a pointed choice, an inevitable choice, um, sort of where that. You know, it's. I guess it's, I guess it's an, an, ever, an inevitable, <laughs> an inevitable choice. <laughs> um, simply because I am a gay man who has thus far survived the AIDS epidemic, and I'm a little queasy about war analogies, but it is a little bit like having survived a war. Um, you see things, you learn things about people. You, you, see, you see acts of, of, of cowardice, and you see acts of tremendous heroism often commit, committed by people who would, you would have sworn didn't have one heroic bone in their bodies. And it's simply part of what I know. Hmm. Um, I don't have a lot of faith in my book's power to help bring about a cure for AIDS any faster. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we do, we, we, our political action is a, is, a, hmm. is a separate thing. We write our books in the hope that they will have some effect, of course, but I don't expect someone sitting in the White House to say, <laughs> President Bush, I've just read this novel by Michael Cunningham, <laughs> and I've realized. <laughs> but it's part of what I know. Mm -hmm. It seems impossible to leave it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I was reading a book by the philosopher Elaine Scary about beauty, and she wrote something that made me think of you. She wrote, beauty is life-saving. Um, and by this, she meant serious and important. Um, and it seems to me that this isn't really a very popular point of view, cri critically, politically. It's not something that we necessarily take seriously in, in literature, but you know, this idea that beauty matters. And yet it seems to me that you're not only a, a beautiful writer, but a writer who considers that beauty does actually matter. Um, and I wondered what you thought the consequences might be of that view of beauty in your work. Yeah, it's interesting. I know, I, I, it's not something I think of consciously at all. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I'm a sucker for, I'm a slut for <laughs> beauty. <laughs> um, and, and I am, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to see it out of fashion. I look forward to the day when it, when it comes back. Um, I'm actually not just in love with beauty. I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to, how to put this, um, a, a realm, a, 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 sort of, a sort of one of, one of the, one of the, one of the nearer realms of beauty um, that borders sentimentality. Hmm. I'm really interested in flirting with sentimentality, with a kind of magnitude. Hmm. 
Um, I just feel like I want, as a reader, big, beautiful books. Um, I'm not uninterested in smart, ironic little books, but I feel, <laughs> I feel like, like you know, the, the vampires are always coming for me, and I have to have something large and beautiful to hold up to stave them off. Um, I was just, there was a great show at the Metropolitan, a little tiny show in, in, in the Metropolitan Museum in New York of uh, this, Ger this German romantic painter who I actually wasn't familiar, familiar with named um, uh, Friedrich, mm. Caspar David Friedrich, mm. um, who was unabashedly swoony about beauty. It's like two, <laughs> 200 years ago. And the Met has just, with, with great pride, acquired this, this famous painting of his, it's, it's two men looking up at the moon. Huh. And, and it isn't sentimental, but, but you can see sentimentality from where it stands. It's so close. <laughs> and it turns out that this painting, these two men, in, 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 in a winter woods, bare trees all around, the moon rising, probably inspired Samuel Beckett to write Waiting for Godot. Really? Yeah. Yeah, he saw it. He was very fond of it. Um, Huh. It's, it was fascinating to me the way this kind of lush, beautiful thing could then inspire something that has many qualities, but you don't, we don't think of it as an especially beautiful or lush... Not lush. <laughs> ...work of art. And I love the idea that, that, I don't know if our fundamental human needs change, but, but what we get hmm. keeps changing. And, and what seems, I think, sort of overblown and a little bit mawkish now will probably seem just right 50 or 100 years from now. I'd love to live that long. <laughs> um, one of the things that's always struck me as being very interesting about The Hours um, is that it's your first novel that doesn't have a lot of explicit sex. And maybe it's just me. Um, <laughs> but, but the other books actually were quite strong and careful and um, in many ways radical in their depictions of sex and in wanting to talk about sex. Um, whereas in the hours there, there's this kiss, like a refrain, uh, these sort of kisses of great intimacy, um, but not, you know, sex per se. Um, and I wondered what made up that artistic decision and what it did in the book. You know, yeah, I... I couldn't help but notice that I finally write a book in which no one gives or gets head and I win the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> I can't imagine that's entirely coincidence. Um, <laughs> Although if that's all it took. <laughs> you know, the fact that all the, that all the sex in the hours is, sub, is, is subliminal, is all done with kisses and, 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 and gestures either made or, or withheld, simply felt right, simply felt like um, what that book needed. And, and as compensation, because I got a lot pent up over those over the years <laughs> I wrote. I wrote the hours. Uh, the next book is full of sex. Full. It's all sex. <laughs> um, no, it has many elements, but but sex prominent among them. In part because one of the things I really look to writers now to do is write about sex. For the first time, we can, and um, it seems such an incredibly rich fertile area of, of, of human, I don't want to use the word interaction because it's an ugly word, but you know, of, of mm -hmm. human drama, of, of, what, of what, we're, what we're doing to each other and, and, and for each other. And the idea of, of sort of stopping shy of the bedroom and then skipping over to the next morning feels almost criminal, it, it, narratively and aesthetically criminal to me. It's very hard to do. Mm -hmm. Oscar Wilde once said, Everything in the world is really about sex, except sex. Sex is really about power. <laughs> and it's fascinating trying, trying to do it. Um, the language thins out. The English language suddenly abandons us. 
there is, I have noticed, in trying to write about sex, no word I consider acceptable for a woman's sexual organ. It has no name. Vagina feels clinical and, and um, it's not, it's, you know, it's ew. It's not, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's a doctor word. Um, but then everything else, every other name it has, certainly coming from a man, feels a little pejorative. Yeah. And I couldn't help but notice, oh, we don't seem to have any name <laughs> for this organ, do we? And that's been really fascinating. It's fascinating to see the language start to, be, start, start to exhibit some of, mm -hmm. of, of its um, prejudices and reticences mm -hmm. in its vocabulary mm -hmm. and what it simply doesn't offer you as a writer, and you have to work around that. How did you work around that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could leaf through some passages. But just <laughs> It's, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm trying to remember the words, the specific words, they escape me now. Um, well, we'll look forward to the next book for, those, for that reason. Um, when I think of you as a novelist, I often think of you with kind of Updike on one shoulder and uh, Broadkey on the other. Oh, um, great. Because, um, because you've always seemed to me to write novels that are not necessarily novels in the conventional sense. They're more kind of like what novels dream about at mm. night. Um, and I wondered if this, you know, if this came naturally to you or if you kind of dug for an aesthetic. Uh... You know, yes and yes. Um, the, the way I write, whatever that is, does, does come naturally. These are, these are the sentences as they as they fall onto, or, they, or they, they project onto the screen. I love my computer. <laughs> I, love, I love little liquid letters made of light that are exactly halfway between your consciousness and the page. Anyway, um, but, I, but I am the whore of beauty, and I do try to um, make every sentence sing and sizzle to the best, to the very best of, of, of my ability. And I do fret and fret and fret over it. And um, the final thing, whatever its, whatever its, its um, virtues and, and, and deficits, is a much more sort of lush, rounded piece of writing. Than, 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 what, than what comes out initially. I have a certain, this is a slightly far-fetched analogy, but I, I've, I've been in Europe a lot the last couple of years and um, in cathedrals and, and, and places like that. And um, I found myself, though it was, it was of course amazing to see the Della Francescas, I found myself equally drawn to the, the little swimming carp that some anonymous person had carved into the baptismal font. And I guess I felt at least as much affinity with the person who carved every scale on that carp as I did with Della Francesca. Beauty in the, in yeah, the, the yeah, precision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, ur the, urge, the urge to create something with a kind of everyday beauty. And you hope a larger meaning too but the everyday beauty of people living their lives, doing their errands, getting up, getting up and down off of furniture. It, it reminds me of something in the hours that, um, that Richard, the poet, says, which is, I wanted to create something alive and shocking enough that it could stand beside a morning in somebody's life. And that always seemed, when I read that line, it seemed to me very much of your aesthetic. and, and yeah, sort of Ars Poetica um, of, the, of the work. I think we have time just for one more question. Um, oh, so it's just a little one, which is, um, after September 11th, how do we write? Oh, God. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, you know, it seems like a significant problem in large ways and small ways. You know, for yeah, one small example, yeah, the yeah. vague present feels no longer yeah. possible. We need to know, is this person walking down the street before right. or after the World Trade Center? 
collapsed. Um, so I just wonder yeah. if you could speak to that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think I probably went, I, I, I went through what I suspect are probably the sort of standard stages that are probably, I, I, I imagine a lot of writers went through. The, the, my initial, when I could think about writing at all, which was, was certainly not immediately, I thought, yeah, right, we need more, we need more novels. Mm -hmm. It's just like, forget it. Um, and then I thought, no, we need novels about this, um, which I think we do, but I think we need just more books, more good and, and, and possibly even the occasional great books, because when you look at history, people have written in the face of unspeakable things. Look what's happened. Look at everything that's happened. And there's still poetry. And there are still novels. And um, we need them more than ever. Big ones, beautiful ones, on every imaginable subject. Seems like Rather time. Thank you.